and then afterwards uh, I interviewed about three of the pastors and it was quite a good conversation quite interesting but I noticed for each of the interviews that I conducted when the topic of money uh, came up and how the church is funded and how they themselves make money uh, I got an equally cagey response from each different part of that interview so again that kind of set alarm bells ringing and by the time it was time to leave having um you know visited and observed the service and done the interviews I just had a distinct feeling that you know, I couldn't rush to put my name next to any um, profile of the church, positive profile of the church, without doing a bit more digging, particularly where finances are concerned. And so the following day, I went into the, um, you know, the newsroom, uh, gave a, a debrief to my editor, filled in my editor, about my concerns around SPAC Nation and asked if, if I could possibly have some time of diary to just do some do some more digging around it and at that point also voiced my concerns um, and at that point uh, my editor her name's Jess Brammer she um, went and got Emma pulled Emma out of a, a meeting I believe um, and all three of us just put our heads together um, and, and came up with a plan really to just see what we could find out and, and that's that's really where, where it began can we have the next slide please then? Okay, so what happened next was, um, at this point, it was, you know, about looking on social media. When I went, first went along to SPAC Nation, I was aware of some concerns that people held. I heard rumours that, you know, some people felt that it was a cult, uh, felt that people were being exploited. I wasn't really aware of, of the scale of these, these concerns or the allegations, but I was aware that there were a few people who... Uh, of the belief that all was not quite as it seemed with SPAC Nation. But, you know, after you know, having had the meeting with Emma and Jess, I went to social media and literally typed in SPAC Nation and a sea of different tweets um, and posts and also a few things on Instagram and Facebook um, came up. And, you know, at that point, it occurred to me that this was more than just like, you know, the sporadic, you know, social media post here and there. This seemed to be like a collective uh, cry for help, a collective, um, you know, collective outpouring of concern around SPAC Nation. And so that, that you know, that was further a cause for concern, looking at the sheer amount of, um, of, of tweets. But with a lot of the tweets and um, social media posts, there weren't uh, what we'd call receipts attached to them receipts being like hard proof like you know attachments of whatsapp conversations or incriminating voice notes or anything like that these were just people um you know echoing concerns that each other had around the church so at that point i made the decision you know to approach people who gave the most detail i guess in in their tweets and and and, and in, implied the most that they perhaps knew information on, on a greater um, level that would, you know, lead to us getting to the, the truth of what, what's actually going on with SPAC Nation. So I approached, uh, you know, sources. You can see two pictures on the screen. That's TK to the right, to the left, sorry, left, right, to the left. Um, he's a rapper and, um, and he used to attend SPAC Nation. He actually starred in BBC Three's three-part documentary about SPAC Nation. And on the right, you have Toye. Mary um, and Toye is one of the first people who I approached on Twitter for, um, you know, just to ask her of her experience. In her tweet, if I recall correctly, she, yeah, she said that she was a former member who had a bad experience. So that was enough to kind of suggest that, you know, she had a bad experience and she left and she would perhaps know something. So I approached um, Toye and it was just very important at that point in time to just make it clear that we were the good guys, you know, we, we, we are journalists, but we are interested in getting to the heart of the matter and getting to the truth of the matter. Because at this point in time, a lot of people, uh, young black people in particular, who were even concerns, felt very strongly that they had been ignored by um, not just the media, but, you know, institutions like the police, but specifically the media, because as I said earlier, the media were you know, producing glowing reports about SPAC Nation, um, despite uh, the, the, the sea 
of allegations and concerns that had been raised by uh, predominantly young black people. So, you know, approaching Toye, um, I just said to her, we want to get to the heart of what's going on. I understand, or it seems you've had a bad experience. Would you be prepared to speak with me? And at that point in time, I also, you know, made it clear, just, just gave a bit of insight as to where I'm coming from as a, as a young black woman myself, as someone who grew up in the church, who has a very good idea of, you know, what church hurt is like and the needs, particularly, you know, you know coming from a Christian background, the, the, the need or the, 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 the prioritization of finding a, a proper spiritual home. So I was very transparent with her and very open with her. And that's actually an approach that she um, really uh, said that she was able to identify with and led to her making the decision to speak with us and it was trust building so it wasn't just straight on the record you know we met up for coffee a couple of times we spoke on the phone it was it was a, a very intricate process of trust building which eventually led to her actually being at the heart of our investigation um next slide please oh it might be you next yes oh no it's me okay so <laughs> um yeah so with toye she as i say she was at the center of the investigation she had been um exploited by one particular pastor by the name of um pastor george jumbo and it was a process what in, it entailed really a process of what has been described as grooming um at the hands of george so you know it was very much she was under the impression that they were, um, you know, friends and he cared about her. And, you know, it's, that, that was laid bare with, through the WhatsApp conversations. Um, and so I met up with her and she passed over the WhatsApp conversations. We made copies, but, you know, in Toye's case, there were letters that came to her house um, notifying her that she'd been signed up as a guarantor for for loans and loans were taken out in her name behind her back again this confidential information of hers was divulged through um through personal conversations through george and he essentially took advantage of her so we gathered whatsapp conversations and chats some of which included voice notes um there's one particular voice note where george can be heard apologizing which was kind of gold for us in terms of the investigation that's an admission of guilt um but also bank statements and um, yeah, letters. And so th that alone, in terms of the process, took a number of weeks uh, just to compile and get together. And that, that really helped to consolidate our investigation. But, you know, that process of, you know, gathering this kind of important documentation, um, you know, took place across all of the sources, not just with Toye, um, but with others as well. And it, it, it really helped to stand up uh, on investigation of exposing. I'll pass over to you, Emma. I think that I think that's you next. <laughs> it is. Thanks, Nadine. Um, just to say as well on that source work, which was a huge part of the investigation, and um, with Nadine's um, ability to win trust and get those sources to go on the record was such a key part of legally being able to publish the story because um, it really um, helped us with the lawyers just to show that we had verified um, accounts from a named person who was also happy to be photographed as well as uh, all of that sort of documentary evidence that we gathered. Um, so with, us, with stories like this, where it often depends on people's voices, it, it's really important to try and get some sources on the record if you can, even though in this case, the sources took a real risk because they were really worried um, about the repercussions of, of doing that. Um, I just thought I'd talk about next kind of what we found um, and other, uh, other strands of the investigation. So we, we found when we were um, doing the work that there were kind of two key lines in the investigation. One was the loan scandal where young people were being asked to take out money um, by pastors to donate to the church. But there was a second strand of allegations relating to safeguarding, alleged safeguarding abuses um, linked to the church. Um, we sort of separated our investigation into two halves, looking at both of those things. Um, the safe, in terms of the investigation around safeguarding abuses, a big part of the story were what were known as the Spat Nation trap houses. 
Um, these were kind of safe houses that, the, that had been set up for young people that were escaping gangs to go and live in, and they were run by pastors. Um, trap houses stands for take risks and prosper, um, but the terminology was very much echoing um, that used by gangs to describe houses where drugs are cut and sold. So it was playing into this sort of terminology that Spat Nation used where they're trying to echo the culture and language of um, street gangs to um, encourage those young people to, to come and join the church and leave that lifestyle. So we found that at its height, there were about 20 trap houses that were run by Spat Nation pastors. And as I say, these were supposed to be safe houses for young people escaping gangs and to take refuge in. Um, but did they really offer a place of safety? Um, we started to investigate um, some incidents that we'd heard about. Um, one um, involved what became known as the belt whip video. Um, and you can see um, a still from that on the right hand side of the screen at the moment. Um, the video was really worrying. It showed a pastor apparently whipping a young man um, with a belt whilst reciting a biblical verse. And it was alleged that this took place within one of the Spat Nation trap houses. Um, we looked into the incident, we got a copy of the video, we tried to um, verify who was the, the pastor um, in the video, we spoke to sources who, who were able to, um, to, to cross-verify the information. Um, we also obviously approached the people that were in the video and it was actually later dismissed as a joke both by the victim and by the other people that can be seen. Um, but the sources that we told we spoke to told us that it was actually anything but it was a vulnerable young man in in the image and to have had sort of thousands of people see that circulate on social media seemed to be a clear a clear safeguarding issue um, but we also started to look into who the guy was uh, who was holding the belt in the video um, and we managed to establish that um, sources were saying it was a, a senior pastor in the church called Enrique and um, we found not only was he kind of an up and coming star within SPAC, but he had also been named as one of London's 25 most influential young people due to his work with SPAC Nation. The um, tweet screen grab on the left shows him with the leader of SPAC Nation um, being recognized um, for that award. Um, so he was, he was somebody of real influence within the church and the sort of dichotomy of this image of him with the belt versus the public image. Um, he did a lot of TV work for SPAC. Um, was really quite striking and perhaps just played up um, some of the potential um, for um, safeguarding abuses when you have this sort of power relationship within the trap houses of the senior pastors and these quite vulnerable young people that were coming through. Um, another incident that we um, investigated involved the alleged sexual assault of a 16 year old girl at a trap house. Um, we were able to verify that by finding a statement from SPAC Nation itself that it had issued at the time about it. So, with all of these allegations we were perhaps seeing things on Twitter and hearing them for sources but also trying to cross-reference that to other sort of documentary evidence as, as Nadine was talking about earlier. Um, so yeah that, that, that also stood up. Um, we also were looking um, through um, sort of Spat Nation's own references to these trap houses and they were such a key part of the sort of PR message um, of the church and, and their work and how they were managing to make this sort of dent um, in London's life crime epidemic by, you know, um, getting young people to, um, to join the church and, and leave that lifestyle behind. Um, interestingly, when we approached the church about both of these sets of allegations, they distanced themselves from the trap houses and said that um, they were run by individuals and were not linked to the church but it was seemed to contradict their own information because we'd seen numerous examples um, on their own social media accounts where they referred to the church the trap houses as theirs so it raised this question really of if Spat Nation was saying that they weren't responsible for safeguarding within the trap houses then who was when it seemed clear that there was uh, there was a possibility and in fact had been confirmed allegations of, of um, safeguarding abuses having happened. Um, another line of investigation um, involved another senior pastor called Marion Mola, um, who you can see on the screen um, at the moment. Uh, she oversaw one of the love house, uh, one of the trap houses called the Love House, which was home to vulnerable young women who had nowhere else to stay. Um, we managed to establish quite quickly that Marion Mola had 27 convictions for fraud and dishonesty, which we thought raised some questions about her suitability to run a trap house. Um, we had heard rumours that she had these convictions, but of course we had to go and try and verify this as well. And we quickly found press clippings that um, cited the previous um, cases, but also interestingly a case citation on her um, defence barrister's own website. Um, 
talking about the conviction, which I, I just found really fascinating. <laughs> um, the reference on the defence barrister's website actually said that the judge in the proceedings um, where she'd been previously convicted had described Marion Mola's offences as the worst frauds of the kind that he had seen. Um, so I thought it was interestingly damning that um, a defence barrister actually had this amount of reference up to the case. Um, I think there's a good tip there. It's worth thinking about other sources like, you know, barristers or, or um, law firms when you're trying to confirm um, previous convictions like that. Um, so we knew that she had this background um, of fraud, um, of being a convicted fraudster, but yet she was responsible for a house full of young women. Um, another interesting thing about SPAC Nation was that the pastors often preached live um, on Periscope, um, and so we were able throughout the investigation to use Periscope clips um, of the pastor's own words to go back and sort of trace what they were saying about what they were doing within the church, but also what they were encouraging young people to do. Um, and we found Periscope skips and um, clips of Marion Mola referring to the um, young women that she was kind of overseeing in the Love House, being in 250,000 um, yet she was still instructing them to sew everything back to SPAC Nation and she said um, within that clip that you must give a minimum of £100 a week. Um, some of the um, sources that Nadine had spent so much time talking to had really brought out this idea of seed giving at SPAC Nation, how much pressure there was from the church to give money um, when you go to services. And this so everything back to the church was again um, sort of really prevalent in the language there. Um, it just showed really the pressure that the young people living in this house were under. Um, we put these allegations to Marion Mola, um, as you always do um, when you're doing this kind of story. Um, interestingly, um, with SPAC Nation, we had to, in some cases, use Twitter um, to approach sources for rights of reply um, because there was no other way to contact them, but we, we could easily get to them through Twitter DMs. So we had to do that with Mariam and she actually um, sent us back a, a Twitter DM response, um, which might be a bit obscured on your screen, but said, um, not interested, please kindly publish what suits, all the best, Mariam Mola and then an emoji of a heart, which is the first time I've ever had an emoji <laughs> come back in a right of reply. So we published that um, in the story. Um, so we'd seen a number of allegations relating to safeguarding concerns in trap houses, but also um, we, despite the fact that this was kind of a strong weight of evidence to support those allegations, we also wondered about independent sources that might be able to verify those claims or at least have corroborating evidence. Um, we were able to establish that councils and the police had held London safe, a London-wide safeguarding meeting to discuss um, concerns about SPAT Nation. So this is a separate, completely independent source. Um, and we also found that the Charity Commission had opened a case about governance issues at the church and neither of these things had ever been made public before. So um, alongside um, what the sources were telling us, this was, um, we felt quite compelling um, sort of allegations um, that raised serious issues about who had safeguarding responsibility for these trap houses and, and what was going on. Um, another of the stories in our series um, was known as the bleeding for seed story and it was actually we published our first two stories which were around the bone scandal and safeguarding abuses um, and we were kind of exhausted. <laughs> It was a long process and we'd been working for months, but um, we did over the coming weeks actually go back and look, just completely sort of look through um, our investigation notes and just check that we hadn't missed anything. We were also hearing from new sources at that time and just, just to see, was there anything else there that needed following up on? Um, I think it's a really good thing to do if you've had a big, busy um, sort of deadline for investigation, just to go back and, and look again afterwards that you haven't missed something that came through at the early stages that didn't seem significant at the time, but was later. And that, that was what happened here, basically. We had had some sources speaking to us about the fact that they were bleeding for seed, which we had assumed was a metaphor for the kind of sacrifice that they were making to find money to give to the church, but it wasn't. Um, it wasn't a metaphor at all. Um, and as we started to ring around and speak to more sources, we came to the kind of chilling realization that people were actually donating their own blood to clinical trials for money to give to the church. And that could be as little as a hundred pounds. Um, multiple sources told us that young congregation members were being taken by pastors to give blood for medical trials. Um, it was alleged that some senior pastors at the church by the sources were also actively encouraging um, the paid donations until the church's leader, Toby Adeboyega, put a stop to the practice. Um, again, we thought about what evidence could, it, could we get to sort of back up these sources, even though we had multiple independent sources who didn't know each other or corroborating the same information. But um, 
it was really common within SPAC Nation that there would be WhatsApp groups for members to share information in. And again, that proved a really invaluable source because we'd been told about a picture that had circulated of a pastor actually giving blood and separate sources have mentioned this. And eventually we did actually manage to get hold of a picture which, which you can see um, on the slide. Um, this proved to be one of the most explosive um, revelations really throughout the investigation and the day after that story was published the Charity Commission actually opened a statutory inquiry into SPAT Nation. Um, it's important to say that SPAT Nation denies the allegations in relation to blood donations as well. Um, just to move on, um, of course, as with any big investigation, we were um, in contact with SPAT Nation regularly and often. Um, as we were um, putting the stories together to get their right of reply. Um, and just for balance to tell you what the church said, um, when we put the, the um, accusations of financial impropriety to, to that nation, the church distanced itself from the actions of pastors saying, a community with hundreds of pastors and ministers cannot monitor what each pastor or leader does. Um, Daniel Ogoloma, who was the main spokesman for SPAC Nation, who we were in contact with, said, I can authoritatively say there's not been a single report about the things that you listed. Um, he added that there are disputes among friends occasionally, and the individual pastors also denied all the allegations against them. Um, so, Having found all of this um, kind of evidence of what we thought were really worrying allegations, we started to ask ourselves, you know, why had um, this fallen under the radar? Um, Nadine spoke earlier about the fact that there was really a slew of um, uh, information across Twitter raising questions about the church and, um, you know, asking uh, why people weren't looking more thoroughly at, at what it was up to. So we wondered about this and, and why it had sort of stayed hidden. And so another sort of core stream of the investigation was looking at um, the links that SPAC Nation itself was promoting to police, to politicians, and thinking about how that had influenced the way that the, the story had unfolded and, and what action was taken. Um, so we went away and we again used the church's own social media feeds and social media presence to check what, what you know, what they were saying um, in terms of the people that they were meeting. And there was tons there. And um, we found that they, the church's leader, Toby, had been to um, number 10 to meet with um, cabinet ministers. He helpfully often posted pictures or videos of what he was doing. Um, just weeks before um, we published the investigation, he'd been to um, the number 10, the um, Conservative Party conference. Um, and had sat just behind cabinet ministers um, for Boris Johnson's speech. You can see the video that was posted in the middle tweet, um, which shows Priti Patel and Sajid Javid, I think, um, just in front of, um, of the leader of the church. Um, he had also been to Scotland Yard and met with senior police chiefs. Um, so I think this raised a lot of questions for us about um, how the church was portraying itself and um, its public facing image was very much around um, a church that had um, access to politicians, to police, um, that was constantly tweeting about, um, the, you know, the fact that uh, these meetings were going on. And I think we felt that in some ways that seemed to have legitimised um, their activities for young people that were, were looking at SPAC Nation's public presence and thinking about whether they might want to join the church. Back to you, Nadine. I was muted. Sorry, <laughs> technology. <laughs> so yeah, um, leading off from what what um, Emma said about creating um, an impression, well, or, or giving the impression, amplifying the impression that they had access to, you know, politicians and the police. Um, so when speaking about this, I always say that SPAC Nation, or you know the leaders of SPAC Nation created a sort of veneer of respectability which served as a, a distraction uh, for want of a better um, term for the abuse that was being perpetrated therein. Um, not only that but SPAC Nation always appeared to, up until our investigation, have the answers to what has been an ongoing issue around knife crime, the knife crime epidemic, and um, yeah, uh, just providing like a safe space, as it were, for, for at-risk and hard-to-reach young people. 
And so that was really the basis of a lot of the glowing media reports that I referenced earlier on in this, in, in, in this talk. Uh, so around October, uh, it was being promoted that Reggie Yates would front a documentary for MTV around SPAC, SPAC Nation, part of a series called Reggie Yates Meets World. And there was a lot of anticipation on different levels uh, for what, what, what the, the documentary would entail. Many people, again, you know, drawing reference to Twitter, a lot of young black people were tweeting, uh, yeah, excitement, I guess, and exp were expressing their excitement for this documentary by Reggie Yates, who's very well, as, as we know, he's a black man, but he's very well respected among young black people. This documentary would finally be the expose that um, many young black people had been calling for, for ages, um, that would lift the lid on what was actually going on or what a lot of people suspected was going on at, um, at SPAT Nation. So Emma and I and Jess and the team were slightly worried about that because if the documentary did what a lot of people hoped that it would do, it's great obviously for uncovering, you know, what's going on and revealing the truth of the matter, but it would blow up our investigation entirely. And by that point, October, we had been working on this for a couple of months. Anyway, the documentary, um, you know, aired. In the, lead, in the days leading up, I remember thinking, well, SPAT Nation's also promoting the fact that they're going to be featured in this episode with Reggie Yates. So that kind of told me that there's a good chance that it's not going to be an expose. Oh, otherwise, why would they be getting behind it anyway? it aired and a lot of people were disappointed because uh, essentially it didn't really tackle the allegations of, you know, SPAT Nation exploiting young people and uh, passing reference was made to it, but it wasn't nearly as in-depth as a lot of people hoped. So there was a slew, a slew of, um, you know, tweets criticizing both Reggie Yates and, and MTV for being a quote unquote, you know, PR piece for SPAC Nation. Um, in addition to that, you know, so, so there was backlash around that. Uh, around that time, the backlash kind of alerted other publications and platforms about SPAC Nation and about the grave concerns around what was going on within the, the organization. And, you know, Emma and I kind of got word unofficially that other, you know, platforms were you know, looking into SPAT Nation at this point, a few weeks before, quite a well-known rapper by the name of Vic Santoro had posted a video on Instagram and Twitter calling out SPAC Nation for allegedly um, exploiting, or one particular pastor allegedly exploiting his younger brother. So media interest was, was drumming up as far as what was actually going on with SPAC Nation. And there was a concern around... Um, around us being scooped, you know, as we got closer and closer to uh, our publication date and eventually that came about in November. Um, but yeah, SPAT Nation appeared to have the answers, um, hence the going media reports. But again, you know, underneath the surface, there was a marginalized group of, of, of people, young black people who felt badly let down by the media and ignored um, time and time again. And that ties into the historic distrust between black community or black communities and, and, and the media. Uh, but I won't say too much because next slide talks about trust and race. So as I say, um, there's a historic distrust of media between black communities, um, from black communities, sorry. And it's worth mentioning at this point that UK media is 94% white and black journalists only account for 0.2% percent of um of, of you know working journalists in the uk so as far as representation that is an issue and many people have said that the reason why or part of the reason why well, it's a chunk of the reason why um you know spac nation wasn't tackled um you know for so long and you know concerned within the black community was ignored for so long is because of the lack of diversity so that i suppose there's an argument for perhaps um, white journalists not wanting to, to touch it for want of a better term for fear of being labelled as, you know, racist or going, you know, going, going too hard or being too harsh with an, uh, essentially a black institution 
and there is also an argument for um, you know the school of thought that puts across the the stance how 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 much does the media care how much do white institutions care about the plight of um of black people and that's something that I addressed in a, in a in an opinion piece that we published around the time that um, we launched our two part investigation and so not only is there a historic distrust of the media but also of other institutions such as the police um, I'll just draw a reference to the tweet that's on 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 the screen that I posted a few days ago actually so I recently received I'll just read it in case you can't make it out it's a bit small. Recently received a call from a vulnerable teen who attended SPAC Nation and was exploited by pastors there. Thanks for not giving up, the teen said. No one else cared. No one ever cares about black people but you, Emma, and HuffPost UK did. And that really underpins the, the, the reason why Emma and, um, and myself and the HuffPost team decided to push forward with this. It was never about um, one upmanship, you know, as far as, you know, our competitors and our other platforms, you know, we're doing something that you're not. It was really about getting to the truth um, of, of the matter. And, and yeah, I mean, even speaking to sources and uh, trying to convince people to go on the record and many of whom did take that leap of faith in terms of trusting us. But, you know, Emma and I were always very clear about the fact that this is about cor correcting the record. Um, it's about rectifying some of the damage that's been, you know, done and, you know, addressing and highlighting the abuse that's been perpetrated by pastors within SPAT Nation. But it is about um, the truth of the matter. And it is, a, is about, again, I always use the term amplifying um, the perspectives and, and the, the lived experiences of people um, who don't always call it a luxury, have, have the luxury of turning on the TV or picking up the papers and, and seeing their their lives reflected um, through the media. And so, yeah, trust, um, you know, has a big part to play in this as, as, as well as race. And um, I mean, this is my first big investigation, well, first investigation, really. It's been quite an education from start to finish and working alongside the great Emma Yule, you know, award-winning investigative journal. Um, it was a real learning curve. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I learned that it's actually a bit of a rarity um, in investigative journalism to cover a story where everyone, sources, those affected perpetrators are all black. So that, that, that was interesting in itself. But um, yeah, trust and race, two very, very central themes to this investigation. And next slide, please, Emma. So what's happened since uh, Pastor Toby, who, uh, was the head of, of, of SPAT Nation announced that he's stepping down and that's as the Charity Commission um, inquiry is underway and that leads me to my next point. So shortly after our investigation was launched uh, the Charity Commission, which is the regulator for UK charities and churches, announced that it would be um, launching an investigation into SPAT Nation and as, as of today, the 6th, of July, as we understand it, that's still ongoing and we've been in, in regular contact with the Charity Commission just to check uh, the status, still on, ongoing, but when, when um, they've reached a conclusion, then we will be notified of the outcome. Uh, the police uh, launched an investigation, an investigation into individuals associated with SPAC Nation. I just want to make that distinction because it's not investigating the church as a whole but individuals but that's still a major step and um, you know they raided six houses and the rest of the man and a few other people uh, we can reveal have been um, interviewed under caution as well so that's still ongoing very much like the Charity Commission investigation. Um, it has been debated in Parliament as well and uh, Steve Reid, uh, who's an MP based in Croydon, has just done truly stellar work in, in, in terms of keeping the conversation around SPAC at the forefront of, um, you know, the political agenda. And, and he, um, he fronted that, that, that debate, that adjournment debate in Parliament. So that's, that, that has happened since. And also just overall a general, um, a greater awareness, sorry, um, of, you know, what's happened the speculation, the truth is, is, is out there in a way that it, it wasn't before. And um, more media attention as well, which is, which is fantastic, you know, following uh, our investigation when that was published, uh, I believe it was Sunday, Sunday Times published 
a piece about SPAC. Um, you know, The Guardian published something on the Saturday. So literally that weekend, actually, I think we published the Friday, um, Thursday, sorry, part one, Friday, part two. Saturday was The Guardian, Sunday was The Sunday Times, and it's just been a, 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 a sea of um, almost endless um, media coverage, uh, specifically about the allegations and about the plight of members um, who have attended SPAC Nation. So, you know, no more of this, these glowing news reports, but it's actually, you know, it's, it's good. And I think it's gone some way to walk towards, yeah, rectifying some of the damage that's been done, um, you know, in the time that this wasn't being addressed anywhere outside of Twitter and social media. And um, finally, less people attending SPAC Nation, you know, which is fantastic. Um, as, as I say fantastic, not to dip into, you know, personal opinions, but fantastic as in until, you know, those who have perpetrated wrongdoings within the church and exploited people have been held accountable and until the gatekeepers of the church and those at the helm have been held accountable and taken responsibility and this has been dealt with um, in, the, in the way that it should. You know, it's only right that people are wary of the organisation, um, yeah, and that has manifested in less people attending the church and just more people speaking about, you know, the examples like Toye, as we see her on the screen, someone who was central to our investigation and other people who have had their credit scores ruined, um, their mental health and, and lives severely impacted through um, unscrupulous members of the church, um, sorry, pastors, um, clergy people uh, within the church you know, it's good that their experiences are being put out there and other people are taking heed. And essentially, uh, you know, I don't say this lightly, lives have been saved through, um, you know, our investigation and us raising awareness about what's happened. And so that has been the impact. Um, and it's been, I, I say no small feats. And the next slide is you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, just, just to add Nazine there, I just thought it might be interesting to say as well that um, in, with, the, with a big investigation like this you publish but it doesn't really stop and we still are actively working on it, not, not as much as we were at the, obviously a few months ago but um, with the police investigation they did initially look at um, allegations and decide um, not to, um, to take any further action and it actually there were further stories and further pressure from um, the MP Steve Reid um, before the Metropolitan Police then looked at further allegations and eventually did open um, a criminal investigation a few months after we first published so sometimes you have to keep going you have to keep um, publishing if, if um, you know we we couldn't really believe, I think, when the police said that they weren't going to investigate given the strength of the um, evidence to support the allegations that we'd seen. So you have to push on sometimes as well, which Nadine. <laughs> I'll say the great Nadine with, um, very much did, and we, we're still keeping in touch with sources and, and keeping on top of the story now. Um, but I think we're gonna move on to questions. Um, I'm just gonna exit the screen. Question. Do I read that? Do I, should I read that? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, um, how did you, this is from Caitlin Hart, how did you organise all the information you gathered from your investigation? Should I go on that one, Nadine? <laughs> um, it was so difficult. There were, there were literally, you know, tons, huge amounts of information that we were gathering. And I, I, I guess kind of two key tips is, um, as I was saying earlier, you have to organise your investigation into strands. So we were grouping together sets of allegations or sources that were talking about similar things, be that the financial impropriety, safeguarding abuses, um, the, you know, the contact between the church and politicians and police. So we would have um, different sets of information. But in terms of physically how we managed it all, um, Nadine and I were, it was quite simple, just working from a shared Google document. And everything that was key to the investigation was logged in that, um, including kind of contact with sources and any key discoveries or key tweets, key pieces of information. So we have a central record that is now hundreds of pages long that, that has all of the key information in it. Um, and that was a really easy way to work. The, the great thing about Google Docs is it's easy to share, it's easy to comment. So um, Nadine and I could both work within that um, quite easily. And um, so I definitely recommend that as, as a good way to work if you're, if you're on a shared investigation. 
really, and I echo everything that Emma said. Um, another question in, in what area, oh, by Michaela Byrne, I've heard, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, in what areas of the UK did SPAC Nation operate and was there a profile of the person they would target? I can jump in and answer that. So um, SPAC Nation operate heavily within London. Um, initially, it's been running for about 10 years, the church. And in the early days, they were based in Peckham. Since then, you know, they, they have a tendency to travel from venue to venue, typically renting out hotel auditoriums and spaces within hotels, and they would have their service there um, each week. So yeah, London, London based for the most part, but they, they have held events outside of London as well, um, in the, like areas like Birmingham. But yeah, I would say that they're, you know, central, like their the key uh, base is within London was there a profile of a person they would target so speaking to various sources they have told us that they would typically target um, young black people from working class backgrounds who live in you know typically disenfranchised areas so um, you know it's, it's been very typical of you know some SPAC nation pastors to perform with you know flashy cars, expensive cars, you know driving one behind the other, um, and go to poorer areas to show off you know you know opulent lifestyles, and entice young people who don't have that who don't live that lifestyle in that way um, to get them to come to the church uh, with a view of exploiting them. We've been told by 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 former members. So I hope that answers the question. Young young black people from working class backgrounds. Um, one of our sources, TK, and you'll be able to see this in, a, in the mini documentary that we put together. The link should be up on the previous screen, but you know, I'll tweet it out after this as well. Um, so TK had said that they, they actually target young black people from what he calls broken homes, you know, who, who are experiencing difficulty at home um, and come from lone parent families for one reason or another as well so I think that that's worth mentioning uh, which is which is quite sad because many of the the young people who have been exploited have spoken of a desire like an initial desire to be welcomed into SPAT Nation and to to really have the kind of nurturing or be a part of a nurturing environment that you know they weren't necessarily a part of within their own homes so it's, it's quite sad on, on, on that front that they would want that and enter SPAT Nation with, with the intention of, of, of being a part of this community um, only for them to, to, to be, you know, badly let down. And so another question is, oh, Michaela also said, not a question, just a comment. This story illustrates perfectly why representation is so important in media, thank you for including. Thank you very much for 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 that comment. I'm just gonna start to lag. Okay, bear with me, guys. Sorry, I'm. Shall I see a couple of others, Nadine? Shall I jump in? Yeah, jump um, in. So Daniel Gain asks, um, are there registers, places where previous convictions are recorded and can be easily found? How were the 27 convictions found? You want me to? Shall I answer that one? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean. Uh, if something's been to court, there will always be a record of it. And the um, obvious place that you can start is just to go to the court and to, um, if you've got a name of a defendant and a rough dates of when things happened, you, you can usually track down cases and get a record. Um, sometimes that can be time consuming. In this case, we were actually really lucky. There had been previous press reporting um, of um, convictions. Um, so we were able to use that, but I, it came from a really, I think the report was in the Daily Telegraph, so it was a really reliable source, but as I say, I still cross-referenced it. And, and we also managed to find the um, reference to the case in, um, in the Defence Barrister's website, which again was quite lucky, but those two pieces of information for us were enough. But had that not, one or either of, um, or other of those not been available, I probably would have gone to the court to try and verify um, the convictions with that. And um, you can also actually sometimes go to the Crown Prosecution Service directly and they might be able to help. So there, there are um, places that you can easily find that information on the public record. So I think that answers that one. 
Um, we've got another one from Michaela Byrne, um, Nadine. Um, did you receive allegations of religious bigotry and how did you respond to that? And do you think more regulations should be in place between religious institutions and their practices of rehabilitating prisoners or helping young people escaping gangs? Um, as these are vulnerable, susceptible people and they can hide under the guise of helping them. Um, in terms of allegations of relig religious, religious, sorry, tongue-tied, bigotry and how, how did it... Actually, I don't recall us receiving allegations of that. That's interesting, but um, I, I, I don't recall that. But what I will say is that I do strongly feel that more regulation should be in place and between religious institutions and, and practices of rehabilitating prisoners, helping young people escape guns, but just generally... Um, helping people and you know vulnerable people as, as you said susceptible people for the very reason that you know they are vulnerable and i just feel like processes should be put in place to ensure that people are being safeguarded as best as possible and that you know no abuse of power is taking place because you know i think it's pretty well documented and, and, and many of us know that abuse of power you know is, can be quite commonplace um across various institutions including religious institutions um you know i've heard examples over the years um growing up of of other churches um taken or people within other churches pastors deacons um taking advantage of, of some you know congregation members and um you know for the most part as far as i'm aware not being held accountable for it. So I think that if more regulations um, are implemented in religious institutions, that would go some way towards preventing um, that from happening. So I absolutely think that that should be the case. Um, thanks Nadine. There's another one from Penny um, who says, for Nadine, largely because there is an air of um, Tuskegee, sorry for spelling, um, about young black people participating in research for money by giving blood and issues of informed consent, common assault. Um, I'm not, not sure of the question in there, but was there any comment you wanted to make on that, Nadine? Um, I think it was feedback. I, th I think that's interesting. Um, research money by giving blood and issues of informed consent, common assault. Um, I know that that's an issue that has been an issue um, in the past and yeah thank you Penny for, for, for raising that. Um, Gabrielle asks how much evidence do you usually need to convince your editor to investigate? It's a good question, <laughs> good question. Maybe we should both answer that one. <laughs> you go first. I was just going to say that um, well yeah actually um, you know working at a came to HuffPost, as I said earlier, in August, end of August 2018, and it's actually my first full-time, um, you know, journalism role. And from start to finish, I'm not going to gush too much, you know, embarrass us all, but it has been, from start to, 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 to present day, I've felt so supported. Um, and, you know, I can walk into a meeting and into, into a, a room with a half-formed idea with no evidence whatsoever, actually, but just like half, just a hunch, really, and um, a kind of idea in my mind about how I want to go about compiling evidence or go about, you know, standing up, to use that term, as we, as we say in journalism, that particular story. And I always, you know, get a lot of support in terms of, Bringing, breathing life into a story and, and, and getting it over the line in terms of publishing it and getting it to where it needs to be. So in answer to the question, um, how much evidence do you usually need to convince your ed editor? Not much evidence, but you need um, a compelling argument. You need an angle. You need to be able to justify why that story is important, you know? And, and yeah, that, that's what I'll say. Um, and I, I say that as a newbie, so to speak. But yeah, I, I totally echo that, Nadine. I think you, um, to like directly address the question, you don't need loads of evidence to convince your editor to investigate. Um, but you do need, you need a good hunch. You need a little bit of something that suggests that your hunch is, you know, there might be some evidence out there that if you spend the time, you can go and gather it. Um, and I think you also need to, as Nadine 
um, really wisely said there, you need to plan. So it's not good enough just to say, I think this is going on. So let's do a story. You need to say, I think this is going on. And this is how I would go about trying to find out whether that's, that, that, you know, whether there's any evidence to support that or not. Um, and I think I would just say that our editor, Jess Bammer, was absolutely brilliant right from the start. I think she saw um, why this story was important. And so we were given a lot of time and space to go and gather that evidence. And um, it, it's only because of that that, um, that the story made it to press. Um, maybe just to move the question on a bit, how much evidence do you need to um, actually get the story published? That's a, that's a completely different question and you, you need a ton. <laughs> You need loads. Every, every single allegation that you want to make, you will need some evidence to show the lawyers that you have supporting sources, documentary evidence, um, corroborated from multiple sources or multiple, um, you know, a, a document and a couple of sources. You, you, you will need that level of evidence for most of the things that you published. And SPAT was, it was a very, you know, it was a long investigation. There were lots of words in there. There were a lot of separate allegations and that's why it took so long to do because we, we had to get that level of um, evidence to back up the allegations that we were making. So that that is where you, you, you do need really strong evidence to, to get it um, past your editor and past the lawyers um, and into print. There's a few more questions. I just want to quickly check how are we doing for time? I know that we... Um, we've got another 15 minutes actually, Nadine, so we're fine. Wonderful. Did you, this is from Julia G, did you have any pressure from the church um, as you were starting um, any digging or did your sources? Another great question. Um, absolutely. Uh, the pressure from, I, I'd say on both fronts, so in the first instance, you know, after I came back from my visit to the church, had the meeting and, you know, Emma and, and Jess um, Brahma and myself put our heads together and decided to, you know, create the time and space and start you know, doing some digging. As part of that, I started to just quietly ask um, questions to people in my network. And it's funny, you know what they say about the world being small. Um, so, you know, I tried to operate as covertly as possible and bear in mind that this is my first um, investigation. So I guess somebody in my network told someone else and another network who told someone else who happened to be, you know, uh, a member of SPAC Nation, a senior member at that, that, um, you know, someone from HuffPost was asking questions. And um, as a result of that, I received uh, a couple of interesting phone calls from, from um, you know, a, a, a pastor at SPAC Nation expressing um, disappointment and, and anger with the fact that, you know, questions were being asked about the church and, and in, in terms of how it's being funded specifically. And um, yeah, it was, it was the equivalent, to cut a long story short, of a, of a, of a threatening phone call. And, um, you know, that quite so early on in the investigation that could have easily have derailed things potentially. Um, but you know, it, it, it didn't, but as far as pressure to not pursue our lines of inquiry, that was, that was um, pretty much a, a constant from the get go. Um, did our sources uh, also have any pressure? They've said, a, f a few of them have said to, to Emma and myself that they did, but I'll, I'll let Emma jump in. To... Yeah, I was just going to add, um, we tried to keep as much secrecy around what we were doing as possible to both protect kind of the investigation, but also the sources themselves and, and particularly being careful with things like not, you know, not even identifying sources to each other just by the information that we were gathering. So that was really important. But th there was, um, you know, we were at points getting sort of trolled by bot accounts sometimes, Nadine, weren't we? Um, that um, we're not 100% sure we're linked to SPAC, but, um, you know, certainly were talking about the issues that we were looking into. Um, we did at points have attempts to discredit information that some of the sources were giving to us that we had to check out, obviously, but... Um, that turned out to be to an attempt to discredit a, a key source in an investigation. So there was sort of counter information coming in all the time that, that we had to assess and balance and, and try and see, you know, um, see through to get to the truth. Um, so it was constant, I would say, the whole way through, wasn't it, Nadine? I think particularly, um, I think the next question is, is on similar territory. Did you receive any comments 
responses from people criticizing you or trying to discredit you? And was that something that you had anticipated? And um, Nadine, maybe you just want to talk about that first week after we published and kind of what happened on Twitter. And Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so yes, absolutely. We received comments, responses from people um, criticizing, discrediting um, both of us. And um, as Emma said, bot accounts, there was one occasion uh, where I, you know, got, I got a, a direct message on Twitter from a an anonymous account that claimed to to be affiliated with Spat Nation, you know, saying I'm coming for you. Um, there was another occasion. This was like within days after us publishing. There was another occasion where um, my uh, an account or somebody attached to an account found my address and and published it on on Twitter, uh, which was that was a very I didn't quite anticipate that I, I anticipated, and I'm sure to an extent I can speak for Emma, a bit of trolling, a bit of, you know, discontentment on the timeline because that's very much been the MO, as it were, of um, SPAT Nation members in the past. They've been known to um, orchestrate, like, Twitter responses or swarms, for want of a better um, term against somebody who's um, made disparaging remarks about the church or criticised the church. So I expected a bit of that to some degree, but certainly not my address to be um, to be tweeted out. Um, you know, in that way, this was through company's house. And um, yeah, it was a scary time. Um, you know, the support of Emma and, and Jess and, and, and wider you know, members of, of the HuffPost team was invaluable. Um, but in and amongst that as well, as a black journalist covering an, or, or seeing through an investigation about a, a black church, a black institution where black, um, there were black victims, but also black perpetrators of wrongdoing that placed me um, in a very unique position. And so in and amongst the trolling and the bot accounts and, and the online backlash, there was, um, accusations of me being a you know an uncle tom quote unquote a coon um somebody who's tap dancing for for master and i hope your white masters are paying you well you know accusations that basically would imply or, or did imply sorry that um i was targeting a spat nation for the simple fact that it's a black institution just like any racist would do you know and not because there were genuine concerns that needed to be um you know uncovered about Spanish so that was very difficult um, as well and it takes it always I always say that it takes a certain amount of resilience um, as a black journalist maneuvering this industry for, for various reasons but just undertaking an investigation of this magnitude um, you know takes an extra extra layer I would say um, of resilience and around that time you know it was a lead up to Christmas uh, I did take a cut, and also Emma, you know, we were totally, we put in so many hours into this investigation, but for all the reasons I mentioned in terms of backlash, um, on top of just being exhausted, um, you know, I took some time out, just a few days to, um, yeah, recuperate and process everything, and yeah, decompress. So long-winded um, response to that question, but I hope that answers every, everything. Really interesting one, Nadine, thank you. Um, another one from Penny. Um, for Nadine, did you find out where these young people were going to give blood for research and which organisations were involved? Yes, yes we did. Um, so yeah, as Emma said earlier about the bleeding for seed at first, we thought it was a, a phrase, a metaphor being thrown around, um, went back to sources who um, were able to yeah, divulge more information, more, more detailed information about what was meant by that phrase. And as part of that information and, and detail, um, it included the organisations involved um, in, 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 um, in, in that. And so we were able to, um, yeah, just do a bit more digging around, you know, like age requirements and, and, and what, what what the whole process um, entailed just to ensure that we, we had our ducks in a row when it, when it came to that. Yeah, just those um, organisations are um, named in the story. I, I didn't name them earlier, but if, if you are interested, then um, they are named in there. And obviously their response as well around their procedures that they use to check that people are giving um, informed consent. Um, from Camilla, 
um, says, thank you both for sharing wonderful insights on such a powerful investigation. Thank you, Camilla, that's lovely. Um, and asking Nadine, as a white Latinx re-representation, using your experience on Spat Nation, what would be your advice when deciding who has the most appropriate voice or direction to investigate an issue, um, even approach sources within the black community? It's such a, these are all wonderful questions. I'm just rereading as you're using your experience, what would be your advice when deciding who has the most support? I think first and foremost, the journalist or the, yeah, the journalist editor, the reporter who's approaching sources and investigating an issue like this needs to have empathy. I don't think that it's um it's always essential for the person, the reporter investigating a particular issue to be of the same ethnicity as those. I think that that's second, that, that, is, that, that does provide important insight in terms of lived experiences. But I think empathy first and foremost, because you're able to um, identify as much as possible with what the sources must be feeling, the concerns that they must have. Um, and I think, part of that comes through being prepared to listen as well more than more than speak and um that way sources are able to and those involved those directly involved are able to provide um greater insight than you would have as the reporter who's investigating an issue and so all of the above um, would put you in the best possible position to investigate an issue like this um what i will say with that being said is that um as a black journalist uh, i was told by sources that it um more often than not helped to put them at ease given the context of um you know a lot of people feeling let down by the media given the global reports that were being produced and the feeling that um their plight was being ignored and their concerns weren't being listened to um as someone who's you know i come from I, we've had conversations and i say listen i come from the same ends that you come from you know i grew up in brixton i grew, grew up in south london um i came from you know a, a lone parent family i used to live in you know brixton prior to gentrification was one of the most socially disenfranchised areas in in, in london so in terms of their background and and, and their lived experiences I've, I've walked that path too, you know, and I'm, I'm still very much there with them. So having that insight helps, um, you know, sources to open up in that way and, and, and trust us. But, um, you know, I think it's a combination of, of, of all of the above, definitely. I hope that answers the question and I haven't waffled on too much. Um, but yeah, empathy, um, you know, being willing to listen to sources and, um, you know, almost be led by them in terms of, you know, important context which you're going to need when investigating an issue, as, as well as, you know, being able to identify on some level with their lived experiences and their concerns, all very important, I think. I was just going to add, Nadine, do you remember that how often we would get, you know, when we were approaching sources, particularly on Twitter, how often they would ask, why should I speak to you? Um, and that definitely spoke to the distrust, but thinking about how you answer that question um, really gets to the heart of why it would be important for them to do it rather than you wanting them to speak to you as a journalist. And I, I remember a lot of times kind of asking you, what, what do you think here? What's the reason that, you know, the young black sources that we were approaching would want to, to speak to a journalist um, at a mainstream media organisation um, about, you know, difficult, risky issues for them. So um, thinking about how you would answer that question for any source, I think is always really important. And you, you brought such insight, I think, into um, the answer to that question that meant that the sources actually trusted us and came on board. That's a good question. Um, should I read out the I'm just seeing if there's more, I think there are more questions. <laughs> Can you see any others? Um, Gabrielle asks, can you only promise anonymity to sources or are there other ways to protect them? Do you want me to answer that one? Uh, yeah, Emma, given your breadth of experience, yeah. yeah. Um, you, you absolutely can promise anonymity to sources, but um, I think that in itself isn't a complete protection and you, you just have to be so careful if you're working with anonymous sources. So I spoke earlier about 
um, some of the information that a source will give you will be so unique to them that even two or three of those pieces of information together will amount to jigsaw ID to anybody else that might recognize them. And in this case, it was a large church, but a relatively small church community in terms of the fact that lots of people knew each other. So we had to be so careful um, not to give away bits of information about sources stories before we published that would identify them to each other, because we were worried, um, particularly with Toye's case, that the church would find out who she was and put pressure on her before we published. Um, so in terms of giving anonymity to sources, you just have to be very careful that you are um, holding records of them and as anonymously as possible when you're speaking to other people involved in the investigation that you're not saying anything that will give away who they are. Um, even in, within the newsroom, um, so Nadine, um, Jess, our editor and I would often be the only people that knew the identity of the sources and you keep a really tight ring around it. Um, and I, I think that's it. You just have to be really careful with the information. In terms of ways to protect them, um, I think it steps beyond journalists' duty to talk about protection of sources in terms of, I don't know if you mean maybe, I don't know, physical protection or, um, or something like that. I think your, your duty um, to an anonymous source is, is to make sure that they, they stay completely anonymous, um, even through you know, publication through speaking to other people um, that you know their identity needs to just be um, known between you and them basically. Um, Julia G asks, uh, sorry to hear about your experiences but taking time out to recuperate is important and having colleagues and friends who've got your back from Julia Gregory. Hi Julia. <laughs> um, I think we both echo that Nadine wouldn't we? We both say we came out of the investigation having made a new friend as well. So. <laughs> life <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. it was tough in places and we've relied on each other a lot didn't we absolutely and julia i've worked with you before and similarly when we were working together as well it, it always helps to have another journalist that's working really closely with you that you can um get support from and the hug when you need it i think <laughs> julia says don't give up as well which i heartily agree with <laughs> thanks julia it's good advice so many great questions and comments and just scrolling down. Um, there's another couple of people saying thank you, thank you so much for the kind comments, really, really lovely to see. Um, Natalia asks, um, this will probably be our last question actually, just looking at the time. Thank you for the excellent presentation. I'm wondering if the safe houses, um, there were supervision by social workers and if yes, were there any official reports of abuse? Um, the safe houses weren't officially registered, um, which was one of the issues that we were trying to highlight, I suppose. Um, so there was no supervision by social workers and there are no official reports of abuse. Um, one of the key things that particularly Steve Reid has been calling for is a proper safeguarding investigation into what's happening within those safe houses. We don't really know how many are still operating or, or what the safeguarding structure is. So one of the key issues that we were hoping to expose really, I think, is that, um, that that seemed to have fallen completely underneath the radar of social services. So there, there are questions to be asked there as well. Um, did you have anything to add to that, Nadine? No, no. Um, as we do have one more minute and there's one more question. <laughs> I'll just rush it through. Um, so Miguel Rocker says, how did or do you verify and follow up on sources on a case like this? What steps do you need to take to mitigate, mitigate against any possible pushback from the church, e.g. defamation suits? Um, he says, apologies, I'm a total novice here. Well, brilliant question <laughs> from a total novice, Miguel. Um, did you maybe, do you want to talk about the sources bit, Nadine? Um, verifying sources, how did, how did you verify from up on sources? So it was just a case of, um, you know, having very detailed conversations about, you know, the experiences of, of, of individuals uh, who, who had left Spat Nation and, and their sources and doing a lot of cross-referencing, um, you know, to establish, you know, just a, a, a wider um, narrative, which we pinned the um, investigation to. And so that just meant having a lot of conversations um, in terms of compiling documentary evidence as well, WhatsApp um, conversations, voice notes um, within those conversations, bank statements, um, you know, and cross-referencing um, there as well in order to just verify. And, and, and if, you know, particular names came up 
um, across different interviews or particular um, phrases were used or, you know, people echoed the experiences of other sources, then it was a case of just going back and forth a lot. Um, so yeah, it was a very rigorous process in terms of the steps um, needed to mitigate against pushback. Emma was probably the best place being the pro. Yeah, <laughs> um, it, it's um, the stuff I talked about early. You, you need to have some sort of um, evidence for any allegation that you want to make. So for example, if um, a young person alleges that they've been asked to take out loans and that they've been pressured to um, donate the money to the church, we would be looking for paperwork to show that those loans were taken out. Um, in that case, we also um, used um, email evidence. So um, Toye had emailed the church to, to complain about the fact that the loans were taken out, um, which was dated and showed that she'd made a complaint in real time. Um, as soon as it happened, she'd written to the loan company. So all of that documentary evidence backed up what she was saying. Um, that still, you know, is just support of an allegation. And until police or the you know, charity commission make any findings against that, that, that's what that is, it's evidence of allegations. Um, but you need to have that evidence there so that if there was a defamation claim, you, you could show um, the evidence that you're, you're pointing to. Um, sources and cross-confirmed sources are really good, but um, having that sort of documentary evidence um, just adds real weight to, um, to your arguments when, when you come to, to speak to the lawyers about a story. Um, I was just going to say, I think this is such a modern investigation in terms of how much we relied on social media and what a godsend it was for us really, because so much of what we were being told about was documented in WhatsApp chats in real time again, just being able to go back and see the conversations um, and check tweets on social media. And there was just so much, so much evidence you know, there potentially for us to find um, that when we were being told something, we would go away and check it. So I think it's just gather, gather, gather as much information as you can and, and cross-reference it as much as possible. Absolutely. This has been good, I think. <laughs> I think that's us that time. Um, I'm sure Marina is telling us that <laughs> it's time to wind up. So I guess that's it. Um, thanks, yep. Yeah. Thanks to everyone for tuning in and amazing questions and wonderful feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you.